And today's reading, I'm going to continue on uh, working through the Gospel of John. And we're at John chapter 6, verses 60 through 71, which brings us to the end of chapter 6. So next week, we'll be in chapter 7, moving right along. But listen now, and read along with me in the Word of God. On hearing it, that is what Jesus had been saying before, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You don't want to leave me too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who though one of the twelve was later to betray him. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. I do pray, Lord, that um, only what you wish to be heard today will be heard from the mouth of your servant, that the meditations of our hearts and the words on our lips will bring glory and honor to you, O Lord. Help us to listen with open ears, receptive spirits. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, if success was measured by church growth, <laughs> Jesus was a failure in today's text. The result of his preaching and teaching was that now many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Doesn't Jesus want followers? Well, of course he does. But he wants followers who will believe in him, not just use him for their own ends. Some of them were offended that Jesus would not be the political Messiah who would free them from Rome and keep giving them free food too, the way they had enjoyed the feeding of the 5,000. The hard teaching mentioned in today's part of the conversation was the idea that Jesus is the bread of life and we must eat his flesh and drink his blood to have life. And then he says to his disciples that the flesh counts for nothing. Is that a contradiction? No. It is Jesus' explanation that his words about eating his flesh and drinking his blood are really about the spiritual reality that we must depend upon Jesus himself for our eternal life. Him speaking about flesh and blood was his dramatic way of saying that faith in Jesus really is a matter of life and death. Also, when Jesus said the flesh counts for nothing, we have to make sure we realize he was not saying that the actual physical sacrifice of his flesh on the cross wasn't really necessary. No, he's emphasizing again that mere human thinking without the assistance of the Holy Spirit can't understand the significance of what Jesus has really come to do. Thus. Anyone who is offended by that kind of language to describe the spiritual realities of life in Christ is just not listening for the real truth. And Jesus explained, This is why I told you that no one can come to the Father unless Jesus, unless no one can come to me, excuse me, unless the Father has enabled them. Jesus says in another place, My sheep know my voice. These are the people who are enabled by the Holy Spirit 
to hear and understand what Jesus is really talking about. Many are called, few are chosen. Jesus said that too. And if they're offended now because he's talking about things this way, how will they cope when Jesus is crucified and they see it in living color in all its graphic brutality? Jesus literally offering his body and blood on the cross. The grasping of the significance of Jesus' teaching is a gracious gift of God by his spirit. Just as Nicodemus heard it, birth from above and the spirit are both necessary for salvation. It's the same for the simpler down-to-earth Galileans. You must be born again. The spirit gives life. But many people do not want spiritual life. They're content with earthly things. This is why so many in the crowd were more interested in another meal, more free bread, than in Jesus' teaching or in following him as true disciples. It is why they turned back when Jesus' words became hard to swallow. People haven't changed much. Even today, most folks seem to like Jesus as a great moral teacher, but they want him to be aligned with all the other great moral teachers of all the other religions of the world. As long as you think that religion is about morals, they are all pretty much the same. Oh, they might have different ideas about God and what he's like, but they all agree on things like the golden rule, as if that's the most important thing about religion. And a lot of people think that it is. When I was talking to TJ, the mechanic on Saturday who fixed my car, I found out that he is one of the many who believe that the Bible and its main point really is all about the commandments, the rules to live by, so you get to go to heaven if you're good enough. That's why so many people believe that all religions are basically the same and they do not see the unique view of Christianity. I was recently involved in a discussion about ethics that was sparked by this comment. Without God, ethics is meaningless. And I believe that's true. But many people believe that humans would still behave ethically even if there were no God who created us to care. Evolutionists believe that ethics and morality evolved out of the natural law that there is strength and safety in numbers is found in herd mentality among communal animals. Also many mammals care for their young because it increases their chances of survival. They say that's the basis of all our ethics. But the Bible teaches that God designed them to work that way and created biological systems that look ethical in ways that random chance never could. So humans also have some sense of morals and ethics hardwired into us by God's design. So one of the people in that, in that conversation said, I'm sure that each one of these different religions have a basic sense of morality and ethics that might be different than our own. And my response to that was, morality is distinct from theology. Most people pretty much agree about morality all across the different faiths, but their theologies are often contradictory and exclude each other. If one religion says God is one and another religion says there are many gods, they can't both be right. So they cannot all be equally right about God. And according to the scripture, morality does not save your soul. Only correct theology does. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's what people around us find hard to swallow. Why do we have to believe in Jesus? But I would also point out, people naturally prefer the idea that if you're good enough, you get to go to heaven. Many people do not like the gospel because it requires them to admit that they are not very good people after all and stand in need of a gracious and forgiving Savior. My correspondent also said, for instance, the Bible says it's ethical to stone a person to death, but we don't do that anymore because we know it's unethical. 
However, in its time, this was normal behavior. I disagreed with that observation. And I said, according to the scriptures, the reason we don't stone people to death anymore is not because humans have decided it's unethical, but really because Jesus, that is God, relinquished that death penalty when he introduced the age of grace and mercy. Jesus died for our sins, so nobody else has to die for their own sin. God decided to take judgment that condemns to physical death out of the hands of humans. But those who do not repent and seek forgiveness from God will still suffer the death penalty. When they die physically, of natural causes or otherwise, they will suffer eternally, apart from God, by their own choice, according to the scriptures. Natural people don't like that idea either. It is a hard teaching, hard to swallow. Again, my correspondent said, so again, if religions have screwed up ethics, morality, and when it stops those practices based on humankind's understanding of morality and ethics, then that understanding was better than what was, quote unquote, told to them by God. So therefore, morality predates the Bible, predates the defined God, and predates religion. That person would also think, our morality now is better than it used to be in spite of what God said in the Bible. I responded, religions that do not listen to the one true God as revealed in scripture do screw up ethics. Even people who thought they were Christians have screwed up ethics when they departed from God's counsel. The Crusades, for example and slavery and patriarchy. Humans required a great deal of time to discern and understand the true ethics revealed by God in Scripture, such as love your enemy. God said that. And submit to one another, which undoes patriarchy. That's what God says. And few humans really live up to it. And then there's this one. I'm going to quote Galatians 3, 23 through 29. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is therefore neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Note in that passage the banishment of all racism, all prejudice, under the equality of all humans. God said that. Few humans live up to it fully. Humans mess up ethics, not the God of the Scripture. And again, as imperfect and broken as we are, morality predates religion and the Bible only because God wired us, designed us, to care about morals. But good morals are not good enough to save your soul. Good theology does that. Now I want to quote extensively a 2001 article about the state of modern Christianity. No, 2001, 21 years ago now. The article proves that these days especially in America, most people who think they're Christians have really turned back from Christ just like those early disciples who rejected Jesus because he called himself the bread from heaven who must be eaten. Here's the quote. At the dawn of the new millennium, meaning in 2001, well-known leaders of the Protestant evangelical world, including people like Jack Hayford, Tony Evans, Crawford Loritz, Henry Blackaby, Anne Graham Lotz, Kay Arthur, and Bill McCartney, produced a video that was distributed to 300,000 religious organizations in the United States. It was a clear testimony of the church's perilous moral and spiritual decline and its desperate need for revival. Here are a few quotes from the video. 
America is a reflection of the condition of the people of God. The, not the America. America is a reflection of the condition of the people of God, the churches. In a recent study, out of 66 lifestyle categories, Christians are not demonstrably different than non-Christians in any of those 66 categories. So Christians have no credible moral voice in this nation because they behave just like everybody else. God looks into our churches and sees as much divorce in the people of God as he does in the world. God looks into our churches and sees as much abortion in the people of God as he does in the world. God looks into our churches and sees as much gambling in the people of God as he does in the world. And surveys taken say the difference between the churches and the people of the world is hardly recognizable. For the first time in history, and again this is 21 years ago, here in the Western world, the divorce rate in the church is higher than those that are not churched. 80% of all young people raised in the church, faithfully attending church, 80% of all of them leave the church when they leave home. We have substituted programs for prayer and scheduled activities for the Spirit's leading and orthodoxy for obedience and CEOs for pastors and shepherds. We are at crossroads and have got to make the serious changes in the churches. We stand on the critical moment of judgment or revival. We must decide if we will obey. We are at a decisive moment. God must do a new thing in his church. We have so entangled our lives with the affairs of this world and we've made Christianity a show. And all that was observed 20 years ago. Has it gotten any better? Has revival come? Clearly, problems so massive will require equally massive changes. We believers in Jesus have to be willing to take a fresh look at foundational issues in light of God's word with prayer and fasting to determine just what's wrong and what we need to do to change. If we don't have a clear grasp of God's perspective, the right theology as taught in the Bible, and a humble, obedient submission to what God expects of us, the people of God will remain mixed with the world with no clear standard to discern the difference and no way to help those who are holding to a false sense of security. I can't claim that you yourself are not saved, but it is clear that disobedient saved people can't save other people. We can't make new disciples if we're not good disciples ourselves. Some assume that a faithful member of the church, one who attends services, supports the programs, and puts money in the contribution plate must surely be a Christian. Sadly, many can testify that their experience proves otherwise. I know one, and several of you know him too. And uh, I asked him to share his personal testimony with us. Good morning. <clears throat> Don Hoidinga. I just want to take a few moments to tell you my story about my church attendance through the years. I was born and raised near Lake City, and uh, my family went to the uh, Catholic Church where I attended all my years while I was at home. And I never really heard the gospel there. But anyway, I was married and uh, had two children. But uh, within five years, we were divorced. Sometime later, I met my wife, Diane, fell in love with her, and we were married. She had four children. Didn't want to go back to the Catholic Church because they didn't feel divorce was uh, within uh, the laws of being a Catholic. But anyway, uh, after a while, my wife and kids started attending a Baptist church in Cadillac. I didn't really feel like I should be at home while my family's at church, so I decided that I should be the father and, and, and be at church with my family. And I learned a lot 
through the years. I heard the gospel just about every Sunday. I began to memorizing Bible scripture. I had the biggest, blackest Bible. Um, I looked really good, but I was still an alcoholic and wasn't doing things right. Well, anyway, one Sunday, the pastor gave a sermon and he said, there are people that's coming to this church. That's all I do is see them on Sunday. I don't see them any other time. I don't see anything. And if when they left the church today, if they let the door of the church hit them on the backside, wouldn't hurt my feelings at all. I'm going, wow, that message is for me. I quit. I quit going. But anyway, we started attending a Baptist church in McBain. And again, I kept hearing the gospel of Jesus. And to make a long story short, um, I attended a wedding reception downstate and uh, with my brother who was living in Chicago and we met in Grand Rapids. And then I got a tummy full of beer and I rode from Grand Rapids back to Cadillac with my brother. My wife followed behind. Anyway, all the way back, I give my brother the gospel. I had all the scriptures hand in hand, Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Ephesians 2.8.9. Anyway, I had given the whole battle. And he said that, that Christianity is nothing but a crutch. That's all it is. Well, I was pretty upset about that. Anyway, we got back about three in the morning and we went to church that Sunday and the only seats left were the front row seats. So we sat there and I'll never forget the pastor walked up to the podium and it's if he pushed the rewind button on a recorder and when he pushed play, everything that I had said in succession, every every scripture he gave was in the same order that I give them. And I knew that God was speaking to me at that moment, like Don Hoytinga, take a side. Which side are you on? And they gave an altar call. All the emotions erupted. All the stuff I was holding back for so long, I let it go. I squealed like a little girl all the way up to the altar and I received Jesus Christ as my personal savior. And I know a lot of people thought, wow, a local businessman, I thought he'd been a Christian and what's going on here? But I was only playing games of myself. I knew what it took to be a Christian. I just didn't want to let go. And so, you know, it took years, I guess, of going to church, to hearing that message. Some people can hear it once or maybe seven times. It's a national average, I guess, to hear it, but I heard a lot more than that before I finally came to the point that I'm giving in. I'm giving it all to Jesus Christ, and I did. That was the most powerful moment in my life, especially since I held him back for so long and then finally gave in and accepted him as my personal savior. I had a lot of sins to confess. Anyway, I was about 50 years old at the time, but it was a great moment in my life. Thank you for listening. I think Don would certainly say a loud amen to what I'm talking about here today, because he was one of those regular churchgoers who found out late in life that he wasn't saved yet. Also, a friend of someone who wrote the article I was quoting is another example, real short. That friend's story is also in the article, so let's hear his testimony. 
as the husband of a new convert, he attended services and Bible studies several times a week. Soon he publicly confessed Christ and was baptized. He participated in men's discipleship groups where other guys held him accountable. A successful businessman, he was one of the congregation's major financial contributors. But he wasn't saved. He later told the author that at the time he was baptized, even in the water he was 95% sure that God did not exist. But to please his wife, he thought, and to join the in crowd among his new circle of acquaintances, and because maybe this thing just might be true. In his words, he took the plunge. For a few years he was regarded as a faithful member, but in his heart he knew he didn't believe. Finally he got tired of the hypocrisy. He found the courage to knock on someone's door and confess, I don't know God. He began to bear his heart, and the fruit is something he'll always be grateful for, because thankfully, just like Don, late in life, this man too had finally heard enough of the gospel to be believe it and become a Christian. But here's a haunting, haunting question. How many more people are there, just like that guy, just like Don, sitting in pews and serving on committees and even rising to leadership, who really don't believe the gospel of Jesus in their hearts and who don't truly have that eternal spirit, the person of Jesus Christ dwelling mightily within them, people who are really only faking it, like Judas faked it for three years. A recent survey supplies a disturbing clue. The large majority of those who identify themselves as Christian in the United States don't even claim to be spiritually reborn. And on any given Sunday, 41% of the people who actually attend services regularly and are sitting in the pews don't profess to have been born again. The survey adds, most of those people have been attending Christian churches for years and years without really understanding the foundations of the Christian faith and its personal implications. And just as a note here, a lot of those people in all those years that they attended church might say about those churches that they never heard the gospel, but it might be that they weren't listening until finally God opened their ears. You have to wonder how many of those 41% think they're okay because of their regular attendance. You also have to ask yourself, how many of the remaining 59% even know what the term born again really means? Now if that describes anybody here, or anybody anywhere that might hear this message, I don't want anybody to be ashamed about it. I just want you to be honest about it and deal with the question. Please ask me about what it really means to be born again. Or if you have any doubts or concerns, tell me your story and I can help you evaluate your faith. All questions are valid, and I love to answer questions. I've talked to too many people who have walked away from saving faith because they had questions, and the so-called believers around them either could not or would not answer them. In praying about being a disciple of Jesus, the image that came to me was of myself sitting on a log beside him at night around the campfire. His face glowed with the radiance of holy fire, but he might have taken it for just a reflection of the campfire. I realized that sitting there with him meant that I had to let go of everything and anything else that might ever have been important if he were not the most important. All I had was the clothes on my back and a relationship with him. But I get to sit with God and learn from him. And he likes me. He loves me. I see him smile as we talk. So as Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. And yet even among those who agreed with Peter and stayed with Jesus, Jesus gave this sobering reply. Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who though one of the twelve 
was later to betray him. That's in parentheses because at this point in Jesus' ministry, nobody knew about Judas. But after John wrote his gospel, he could insert here that he was talking about Judas. You could walk with Jesus himself for three solid years or more and still miss the salvation he offers if you do not fully submit to his teaching. And this is true too. No one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. But don't despair and wonder why God isn't enabling you. No, ask, seek, and knock. If you desire to know Christ, the Father is enabling you. The reason I'm not making an altar call today to get your decision for Christ is because I really want you to seek me out and talk to me personally. You could do that after the service today or anytime. Make a phone call. I'm available. I want to talk to people. I want to be the kind of disciple-making pastor who answers good and sincere questions. And all of this so that you can know the sincerity of your desire to make a decision for Christ is not just moved in the emotion of this moment, but is fueled by the fire of God burning in your heart. I want to pray with you too and for you. And I want to end this message in a prayer. Lord, your teachings are hard to swallow. That I'm a sinner, that I need to repent, that I'm not good enough for heaven, that you have to be my savior. I can't do it myself. That's not the way I like it. I want you to grade on a curve. I want to be good enough so that I don't have to be perfect. But thank you, Lord. Thank you for making it so clear so plain in this teaching from Jesus that we must be born again. We must accept that Jesus is the Son of God who has the words of life. We must believe His teaching and no other teaching about any other God or any other theology. Only in the name of Jesus can we be saved. And it was so kind and good and gracious of you to even offer that because none of us deserve it. I pray, Lord, that anyone hearing this message today, if they have not already believed it and given you their hearts fully, would let today be the day of salvation for them. That they begin today to believe the gospel, swallow the truth of the word of God, and come to life on that eternal food. I ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.